Welcome to BSRM Presents Straight Talk. I'm Dhaka Tribune editor Zafar Subhan, and I'm joined in conversation tonight by Maliha Kadir, who is the founding managing director of Shahaj. Maliha, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Nice to be here. It's great to have you here. And I want to start right off by talking a little bit about employment. You're an employer here in Bangladesh. You employ many people. What are the challenges you face and what do you think we need to do better in terms of educating our workforce? So I think finding good people is the biggest challenge anybody yeah, in Bangladesh faces. Right. Us as a startup, you know, mm -hmm. not being able to offer a super high salary like the telcos, sure. we face a bigger challenge. But I think it's a, I have hands down seen everybody face it. Yeah. There are two things. One is we can't find skilled people. Yeah. And the second is, people don't know what to expect from a job. Right. You know, there but, are two. But why is this? I mean, you know, every year we have two million people entering the workforce. You know, they have, uh, you have people entering with high school degrees, with college degrees, with master's degrees. Yeah. You would expect that there'd be enough skilled people out there. Why is there this shortfall? Well, it doesn't make sense. We need to overhaul the education system. Yeah. It's totally mukhastubidda. It's really totally people just memorizing Ekhono, things. Akhono, it hasn't hate. changed. You it find. hasn't changed. And, yeah. you know, I went to school in this country only, yeah. um, English medium schools, long time back. And after I came back, like 20 years, 30 years later, I feel like things really haven't changed for the better as much. We have You're more right. schools and colleges now, right? Yeah. Because the population has expanded, which is a good thing. A lot of private universities have come. But the quality of education really hasn't improved as much as it could have. You know? No, and this is absolutely right. I remember having these conversations or listening to these conversations way back in the 1980s. We've always known what the problem is. We've known that our education system is too based on memorization. There's not enough uh, emphasis on creative thinking. We've known these problems at least for the last 30 years, but nothing's changed, huh? Nothing's changed. I think there is a, I think we need to invest. And okay. that's where it comes down to. Yeah. You know, look, it's a big country. A mm -hmm. lot of kids to be educated, right? Yeah. We need good teachers. We need teachers who are who have been properly educated and trained to be teachers yeah. as well, right? And that investment is lacking. Yeah. I feel like that's where, you know, us as a country, private sector, government, everywhere, we have failed to invest in teachers' education. Yeah. And I think it is... It's a huge challenge. I mean, volume is an incredible problem. Scale yeah. is a massive problem in Bangladesh. You, know, you, start, you have a country of 160 million people. How to educate all of them yeah. is difficult. And I feel that the way we've done it, now I think the government will tell you have 98, 99% primary education, uh, you know, boys and girls going there. As we've expanded, the quality of the education has fallen. That's kind yeah. of how we've solved the problem, which isn't really a very good solution, I guess. Yeah. I think what we need to teach our kids, you know, I think it's worldwide, not just in Bangladesh, given how technology is evolving, the world's changing at a very uh, rapid pace, what we need to teach people is how to learn. Yeah. Learning to learn, I think, should be the motto, where people are, kids are learning research-based projects. You know, sure. My kids go to um, American school, and I see them from an early age, like a seven-year-old, five-year-old, you know, researching stuff in their, in their limited yeah. capacity. Maybe sometimes even in Google, they're searching up some small things, you know. So they're learning everything by kind of themselves, yeah. looking at the But that's themselves. what's needed. Yeah. The other thing is I think people also need, if we talk about like people entering the workforce, they need to think a little bit about, you know, what kind of job they want to do yeah. and what is the match between them and, and, and the positions. I don't know if you see this when you hire people, is that there's really no match between the skills you need and the person who's come for that interview. How do you solve that uh, There's absolutely dilemma. no thinking of that. Yeah. You know, I have been really unimpressed when I interview all the freshers. Right. You know, more senior people know it by the time they're sure. senior. But the freshers, I feel like they have, they really have no clue. They have no clue as to what their aim in life is. You know, yeah. they'll say something like a desk job, depending yeah. on the university you're interviewing from. It right. could be a desk job, or it could be like, you know, I want to be yeah, a no, manager somewhere. Saying a desk job, that, that's not that, a... That's just like... I know, that's, just, not a, that's not a goal. It's not a goal. <laughs> desk job, what does that mean? Yeah. You know? I, I want a desk job and I want a, I want a, I want a window. Yeah, I want a window. Yeah. So, no, so I think I th what we need is really career planning um, yeah. offices in all the universities. Yeah. Where kids are taught what is a career as opposed to a job. And what's a career which is right for you? I see it yeah. all the time. I see uh, people coming to me interviewing to be reporters. And they're really shy, introverted people. Now, there's nothing wrong with being shy and introverted. But believe me, if you're yeah. shy and introverted, you're not going to make a good reporter. You might be a sub-editor. But they haven't ever taken the time to match their own personal skill set, their own personality with what they should with, do for a living. Yeah. And I don't know if that's because maybe they 
don't think about it and their parents make the decision and the parents don't know them very well, I'm not sure what it is. But I think I've there are multiple this. factors. Yeah. One is, you know, people are thinking of a job as a way to get money. Yeah. So that needs to change. Of right. course, it will give you money. But you really have to, you will make more money if you go where your heart is. Sure, Eventually, always. right? Yeah. So that... Plus the career planning I was talking about. See, back in university, we had all these kind of tests that were done yeah. on assessing your personality, you know, yeah. and then the career counselors give you some advice. Maybe you look in this area, you know, have a five-year planning. You go for this kind of job, which will help you get a better job in that industry of your choice, yeah. couple of years down the road. For example, if you want to be an entrepreneur, go work for a startup, see the chaos inside, and then you learn, and then you can go start your own thing. So there are lots of different, this kind of advices that a career counselor can give. Yeah. So I think lack of career planning is a big, 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 big issue we have. With the and I, I suppose you have to do a lot of that as the MD of your own company. When people come on board, yeah. you do a lot of that training. You do a lot of the um, skills training, planning, career counseling for them, yeah. I guess. Yeah. We know? end up doing a lot of that, but the unfortunate part is then retention is also an issue. Yeah. How much should we invest in training a certain employee when we know that, particularly in tech, it becomes a big issue. It's a um, big issue everywhere. I mean, in the media yeah. industry where I am, I mean, it's basically our model at Dhaka Tribune is we are a youth-driven organization. So yeah. I have a lot of extremely young, extremely bright people working for me. And I understand if you have people like that, you can't hold on to them necessarily for very long. Yeah. They're ambitious. They want to do different things. Maybe go get another degree, go for a better paying job, um, move into another field. And so we just, we've just we just kind of accepted that there's going to be a massive turnover. And our entire model is based on that. I and mean, I don't know if it's good or if it's bad. I do know that I don't know that there's an alternative. It's very difficult. See, for us, you know, we need people at different levels. Right? Yeah. You need freshers, yeah. but we also need, because we're doing so many new things, you yeah. do need some mature people who can organize this stuff, you know, who have yeah. experience, right? So, you know, retention becomes difficult at all levels yeah. because at the end of the day, people are really driven by money. Yeah. You know, we are a poor country. We are going towards middle income status and all. Yeah. We are growing, but we are still, majority of the country is still poor. And ex Exactly. And if you have, like, you're hiring kids from middle class, low middle class, you know, maybe one can't, fault them. I yeah. do understand people do have family concerns. Absolutely. They, 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 have to, uh, they have to put food on the table. They have to worry about their kids' education. So I do get that. Let's talk a little bit about switching up. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, you've moved back to Bangladesh after being abroad and working in companies overseas, and you've started up Shahaj. And how do you find working in Bangladesh, and how do you find the um, perception of Bangladesh overseas in terms of you've been very successful in bringing in foreign exchange. I think that's one of the uh, things which really distinguishes Shahaj as a company. But I, I, I dare say it wasn't easy. You had to, it, was, it was kind of a tough pitch. So yeah, tell yeah. us a little bit about your experiences there. Fundraising for Bangladesh is really tough. Yeah. The challenge I face, I would say 90% of the challenge is really Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the perception of Bangladesh to the external world is really the floods. Yeah. And the you know poor people and all the negative news that goes out. You yeah. Know? And that's where Bangladesh is not in the mandate of most of the VCs globally right. present, you know, yeah. uh, because it's a poor country and there's no yeah. other reason, right? But there are so many great stories of Bangladesh. Six sure. to seven percent GDP growth for the last 10, 15 years. Yeah. Consistent growth is not a joke. It's a major achievement, right? Yeah. And there's young massive population. opportunity. Here, massive yeah. opportunity, young population. Yeah. Um, so, and very stable econ economy, right? Yeah. So, these are really great stories which they don't know. Yeah. So, we have to do a lot of convincing every investor that has invested in Shahoja. It's their first time in Bangladesh. Yeah. Um, so, we had to, they had to, they looked at all the data and people do get impressed. But if yeah. you don't have it in your mandate in the first place, it becomes a big challenge for them. Yeah. Um, so I think as a country, as all of us, we need to do a lot of work in branding Bangladesh. Right. Um, I would say the government needs to take it up as a project, yeah. invest in it, hire a PR agency from somewhere. Well, you know, you can do this. I believe someone was telling me some years ago, for, in, for instance, India did this at the World Economic Forum in Davos. They took an entire team and they essentially took over Davos that year. Yeah. Okay, so we can do things like this. We can do things like that. There's so much we can do. Why not we hire a PR agency from abroad, yeah. branding the country? Yeah. We see country-specific ads in The Economist, New York Times, everywhere, yeah. right? Why aren't we giving ads on Bangladesh? Sure. You know? So I think we need to proactively address it. For tech sector, there can yeah. be a lot done for getting foreign investment. Why not we take a bunch of 10 tech entrepreneurs and do a Silicon Valley tour? 
Yeah. You know, where we all get our network and uh, invite the major VCs to come and we all talk about our firms. It's all yeah. for awareness. Yeah, because you as know. you say, of course, you know, on the one hand, you know, people, it is not in the remit of VCs to think about Bangladesh as a place to invest their money. But the, the flip side of it is then there's massive opportunity because, you know, it's obviously it's undervalued. It's undervalued. You know, and obviously there's, you know, there's a premium to be made for someone who's willing. Yes, maybe the risk profile yeah. is higher and we can accept that. But with everything in business, there's a, there's a price and it there's a, a reward price. for that, yeah. you know. And so if someone is willing to be bold, if yeah. someone is willing to take a chance and, and you know, that's what uh, VCs are. You know, they, 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 they do take a chance on people. Six. The upside yeah. the upside potential is massive. The upside is massive, undervalued, you know, not really looked up in by the, all the VCs. See, so much money has flown into the neighboring countries. If you look at yeah. the big countries in Asia, yeah. they're flooded with money. I have yeah. friends who are working in PEVC space, and they're mm -hmm. like, you know, we can't find deals. Everything price is jacked up. We have a lot of money. We have to deploy. Then I feel so frustrated that we are just next door within yeah. Asia and we are like crying for money. Yeah. So there's a huge discrepancy there. Investors have a herd mentality. Mm -hmm. Once something starts Absolutely. Flowing, Once flow. someone goes through the door, then the others will the others hold that on. thought. I'm going to take a small commercial break here, but we're going to talk about that on our return. Thank you very much. Sure. <laughs> Welcome back to Straight Talk. Maliha, welcome back. Thank and you. Um, we were talking a little bit about, before the break, about branding Bangladesh and what we can do to make the image of Bangladesh a little bit better yeah. in terms of attracting foreign investment. What are your further thoughts on that? No, I would say really from tech perspective, really do yeah. conferences, not just tech, many mm -hmm. industries do conferences in um, different investor pots, mm -hmm. wherever, wherever they are, yeah. and take the right people. Yeah. Take the right people, you know, obviously take the relevant government officials, yeah. take the private sector people. I and mean, I think what we need perhaps is better coordination and collaboration between yes. the government and the private Absolutely. sector. Maybe that's part of what's missing, huh? Absolutely. That's totally missing. That's missing big time. You know, yeah. my, my limited experience in working with the government in yeah. regulatory policies and all, I think more collaboration is really needed. Yeah. Um, and well, real yeah, I mean, I think a lot of our regulations are, are quite backdated and backward. Yeah. And, you know, the government needs to talk to the private sector and say, okay, what laws can we change? What policies can we change to make us more competitive? If there was, I mean, can you uh, talk a little bit about that? Did you have trouble with the regulatory environment when you started up Shahaj? Is there still something you'd like to change, which you think is a law which is disadvantaging yeah. us or your yeah. company? See, when we started off, we didn't really face any difficulty because fortunately we were not regulated. Yeah. Right. As we came into ride sharing, yeah. then the ride sharing regulatory policy came. And we faced difficulties there. Yeah. The policy was written well, yeah. but in the last minute, some things got into the policy. Yeah. It was kind of like this person said that, that person said that, and some stuff got in. And we suffered for it. Okay. But I would say our suffering was short compared to other industries. Huh? So it's been, what, one and a half years, and yeah. we have a bunch of disagreement points which we don't make, which is basically against the essence of ride sharing, yeah. uh, which some the government has agreed. Mm -hmm. um, to change. Some are still being discussed how to do it. But the uh, more interesting part is in this whole process of dealing with the regulatory bodies for a year and a half, I've realized that whatever issues we had, they also understood that those, they didn't intend those issues to be there. Right. It's just that when it was written, the language was written in such a way yeah. that it was not intentional either. It was just by mistake, the language was written in such a way that it, it gave rise to uh, different interpretations. Right, and so now there's the problem. Now, and yeah. these things can be can be raised. I want to talk a little bit about ride sharing. Actually, let's talk a little bit about Shahaj and the work you do. I think when you started, and what you're still perhaps known for the most is, is a ticketing agency, okay? Then pretty soon you branched out into ride sharing and food delivery where other people are also operating in that space. So tell me a little bit about your thought process. Is a MD, CEO, why did you move into that area? So Shahoj is Shahoj. It's not Shahoj tickets or Shahoj bus or anything right, like of that. It's a super. It's app. a very generic name. Yeah. So the dream was always to build up something really big. Yeah. So my, you know, initial early days business case also had on-demand transportation written on it. I see. So the intention that was, was always, always the there. There's intention always was there, yeah. always there, and I had. It gone seems to like a crowded field, if you don't mind me saying. It is, yeah. but. 
in general, if you look at any countries, not yeah. many players survive in this field. Right. Because it's extremely challenging. The yeah. technology is very difficult. Yes. Um, giving a good service in Bangladesh generally is difficult. Finding good people, so that is there. A lot of funding is needed. Yeah. So good people and funding, both of which are in crisis in Bangladesh, are yeah. really, really needed everywhere, and, and, and but I suppose, more so. And I suppose the tech solutions are complementary. So it's similar, what you need to do for ticketing, what you need to do for uh, events and bus rides. It kind of helps. I mean, I don't know, maybe. So, yeah, let me go back to the strategy. So it was always yeah. to become, the dream was to become the largest destination online, yeah. as we say it. So in that, we started with transportation because it's more of a necessity. So yeah. bus and then rides. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, food, now the theme is anything that moves, moves through Shahoj. Yeah. Um, plus, we'll go to more necessity services, which is the super app idea. You will see that in most emerging markets, if you forget the online, you'll see conglomerates exist more in emerging markets than in more developed markets. You know, you yeah. see the Tatas and all in India, right? And why? Because, because of lack of good people, lack of good capital, if you think of it from a very high strategic level, these bigger companies tend to get more me bigger into different industries because right. they're able to establish the brand credibility in the market to be able to attract more funding and more people and more and resources. And that's where we are in, in our evolution as an economy. As an economy as well. Yeah. So if you mm -hmm. take that parallel to what is happening in tech, you'll see Grab and Gojek, you know, and even in China, Tencent yeah. and uh, Alibaba going for the super app strategy right. essentially, Absolutely, right? Yeah. So that is what we are learning from and trying to do here, obviously customized yeah. for Bangladesh. Have you learned, I mean, I think one of the advantages of doing business here in Bangladesh is you can learn a lot from what has happened elsewhere. So you don't really necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. A lot of it is saying, well, you know, this business works very well in a neighboring country. We don't have anything like that here. Let us try and reproduce it here. Obviously, it needs to be customized because no country is the same. Every country is unique. But what are the... Um, what are the lessons you've perhaps learned from the region in terms of what works and what doesn't work, which yeah. you've brought in terms of, you've brought into your um, strategizing for your business? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's not just Bangladesh, it's actually all of Asia still. If you compare Asia to the rest of the world when it comes to the technology apps and whatnot yeah. are happening, you know, all the basics still need to be done in um, Asia. I was in a conference at Harvard where a Indonesian VC guy was saying that we are still seeing demand in getting the basics digitized. For example, right. we started tracking. Yeah. You know, tracking is so new in Bangladesh and rest of the world as well, you know, digitizing of the trucking industry. Sure. So those things, basics need to be done first before we can move on to more innovation and all. But generally, right. data is king. Yeah. So a lot... Um, can happen through, you know, digging on data. So at Shahoj also we are focusing on an analytics team yeah. um, where we're looking at, you know, trying to predict user behavior um, and therefore give them a customized offer. So yeah. that's a big area where there are possibilities as well. So what I have learned from looking at other companies abroad is tech is very important. Yeah, and I mean, I think is that where you see any real opportunity in Bangladesh moving forward is going to have to leverage um, IT? And in general, we could yeah. grow double, triple what we are growing now yeah. if this country was more digitized. Yeah. You know? Well, you know, I mean, the, this government does make digital Bangladesh Absolutely. part of, uh, you know, a part of, you know, its, uh, it, its, its overall strategy for the nation. So, you know, I think there's an understanding there that we need to go. I'm not sure about the level of implementation. Maybe that could be improved on. Look, we always can improve on what we are working on. Yeah. But if I look at the statistics, I had uh, tried doing online classifieds back in 2007 yeah. in Bangladesh. Yeah. We had around, what, 5 million users. Yeah. Today we have 90 million internet users. Yeah. You know? So that's a commendable success that, it has ha that has happened. But I think there's a lot more that can be done in digitizing and, um, and taking the country forward there. For example, the government's own functioning. Yeah they have to start using email. People are yeah. using email, but I'm saying government offices at all levels, for example, a very basic example, use proper email, um, use calendar for getting organized, um, many more efficiency tools, you know, which increases so now, speed now, now of things. Now you're talking about no, not the government necessarily digitizing. You're talking about government employees government digitizing. Employees now that's going to be digitized. that's going to be a tricky a, a tricky one. I agree it's with you. Possible. It's necessary. It's possible. They're smart, intelligent people. Yeah. And you know, if when they get digitized, mm -hmm. they will understand 
moja of digitization, the fun yeah. of doing things digitally. They should use digital money themselves. Government should disburse, and government is doing a lot of work yeah. there as well. A lot of stuff is happening. Yeah. I think a lot of tenders are moving online, for instance, that's one thing. Yeah. Another idea which I've heard people talk about is that uh, you know when you ask for a government service, you're looking for a license or a permit, if you can follow that process, it's like you order something from yeah. Amazon, yeah. and you can tell where it is, you order it through DHL, you can find out. Right? Yeah, yeah. If you can also do that, okay, it's at this process, it's at this desk. If you could just trace that um, yeah. online, that would be very helpful. I think all interactions of the government with its citizen, to the extent possible and applicable, mm -hmm. should become digital as yeah. much as possible. And the other point I want to raise again is the government employees themselves interacting in a digital manner. Yeah. Unless they use it themselves, they won't understand what they need to offer to the citizens. What do you find in terms of Bangladeshis and actually Bangladeshis becoming digital citizens? You must have a lot of uh, research on this, a lot of data on this. Your average Bangladeshi, what percentage of people have smartphones because my sense is that sometimes you'd be very surprised you know the type of person you wouldn't necessarily expect to be digitally um, literate is actually much more digitally literate if you go to the population then people they have are. really embrace this see ride sharing look at the drivers in ride sharing they come from all walks of life but they also come from literally the less educated uh, yeah. people of Bangladesh right and they're using the app and the ride sharing apps are not necessarily the most simplest app. They're simple right. in my definition, but it's not so simple for somebody uh, from that walk of life. So the point is you have to show them a use. You have to show them a need. And the other problem we have is bandwidth prices are high. Yeah. It's still very high compared to, I know the government's been bringing it down, but it's still very high compared to a neighboring country. Yeah. If these prices went down, the digital proliferation will go up leaps and bounds. And I also think that some things should be made compulsory to be done digitally. Right. Some things that will spur adaptation like anything. Okay. And people are smart. They yeah. are smart. Bangladeshis I mean, think, are smart. I mean, I think that's right. And I think I do think Bangladeshis are embracing it. If we make these changes, uh, increase bandwidth, increase the opportunity to use digital solutions, people will go for that. Anyway, we're out of time today. Thank you very much, Maliha. I've really enjoyed this. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much. It was fun. Thank you. And thank you for tuning in. This has been Zafar Saban presenting Straight Talk on Nagarik TV. Please join us two weeks from today for our next episode. Thank you very much.